All right, all right. We're going to get started here. Thanks for coming out on a Sunday night. I used to come out on a Sunday night to church every Sunday night. And every year when we do the town hall on Sunday night, I'm grateful we don't have a Sunday night. Is that okay? <laughs> Is it okay? Um, I, uh, I am happy to be here with you guys. I love this community. When you walked in, uh, hopefully you got yourself uh, our culture book. It's our first edition, uh, so we're really excited about the start of this thing. Uh, and for me, uh, a culture is uh, such an important phrase. It's such an important language. I'm a psych major, so the study of culture, anthropology, and such was a really curious topic to me. I always loved it. And then being a pastor, there was so many opportunities to observe and see the different kinds of uh, cultural elements in the church as a subculture of religion and then the outside of it and such and such. Um, but does everybody know everybody here? Does, there, does everybody, like, are you guys all best friends yet? Did you, did you pray for each other while I was out there eating and stuff? And did you get to know one another? Uh, and uh, so... Uh, if, you, if you're, uh, nobody's new here, right? Anybody new? Nobody's new here. It's a town hall. You guys good? Vincent, you're new here, buddy? Good to see you, man. Uh, and we are recording uh, this for uh, other people to watch or digest or whatever it may be uh, because we do it once a year. Uh, last time we did it was last uh, May. So we're actually like at 11, 10 or 11 months uh, from the last one, which means we're ahead of schedule, unlike construction. Uh, and... <laughs> So, uh, and just a brief update on the construction. If you're wondering, because a lot of folks were asking me about the details of it and such, like, why aren't we in there yet, Samuel? You're failing us. And uh, the, we needed to fire rate three of the walls. The fourth one that we didn't need to fire rate was the exterior one, like such, uh, going to the outside. The other three we needed to fire rate, which means we needed to get drywall on both sides, and it's a really thorough process of inspection. So you got to get drywall on both sides, but we had to do an alternate means and method because there was so much conduit and things happening uh, once we took out the drop ceiling that we needed to do an alternate means and method, which the city needed to approve. And over like the sound booth area, we needed to do like a, a big soffit about four feet out and all the way up to the ceiling. And then on the other ones, we needed to build like a mini wall so two-fourths of the space or half of the space needed about a mini wall, uh, sixes underneath the, the top of the ceiling line, all the way around, which means drywall, and there needed to be fire rating on all the things. Um, every penetration needed fire rating things, and then you needed to inspect that, and then you needed to inspect the drywall, you needed to inspect the studs, and then you can close it up after all that's done. Uh, and then all of the penetrations for all of the HVAC going from one space to the next space needed fire dampeners. How exciting is that? Did anybody want to hear about Construction 101 today? I didn't. I actually wish I never even found out about any of this or needed to do any of it. But we did, and we're here, and we're figuring it out, and we're going through the process. And this morning, you might have heard me say that this building, the landlord, they've been really gracious to us, but they did give us our 30-day on March 17th which does include and allow us to be here for Easter Sunday. So that's positive. You guys switch sides. What's going on here? You trying to mess with my head? What's going on, buddy? So that does allow us to be here for Easter, which is good. I don't actually want to be here for Easter. I want to be next door for Easter. So we are working to try and get next door for before Easter. That would be the 10th uh, and or at least over there, I should say, for Easter. Uh, and so that's the goal and that's the effort um, if there is a situation where it's looking like we won't be able to be over there, which I don't anticipate. Uh, it's not in my control, but I don't anticipate it. I am optimistic that we'll be able to be in there uh, for, at the very least, after each Easter or the 24th of April. Uh, but in the case that we're not, we're all going to go to somebody's house and have church there. Now, we'll probably do something along the lines of a church in the park or something along those lines to cultivate some kind of gathering of some sort. We don't anticipate this, but in the case that it does happen, my wife is hot on the tracks of figuring out a solution for all of us. Right, babe? No, not a <laughs> So uh, we're really excited about it. But we wanted to gather here and, and talk about uh, kind of the vision for where we've been. So the year in review on this thing, which I think is pretty cool and exciting, um, and if you got this culture book here, I did want to make a quick note about it. 
uh, we wrote down essentially some of the pillar points for us as far as our culture is concerned. Uh, and so for us, it's, it's definitely something we were really excited to do. It's actually something I've wanted to do from the beginning of my time here. And we finally got it done. And so thanks to Christina and Vincent and Alyssa and the team and Tim and everybody involved. Because it really puts forth not only our core values, which is a great conversation I've been having with a lot of people, but it also puts forward our basic foundational uh, visions, love Jesus, love people. And then as it relates and extends to some other things, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, which love governs. And then, which our activation uh, will be doing a lot of over the next six to nine months, which is Discovery Journey Partnership. So we're going to talk about all these things. Uh, and uh, this is the, 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 Q, the Q&A number will be up here most of the time. You can write a question at any time. They're putting it down, and then it's on this iPad here. And then Tim is going to be uh, really leading the way and moderating for all of it. Uh, so we already have some questions. Is it possible that we all pray together now for the permits and everything that needs to be done and or approved to happen? You guys want to pray for it? Okay, let's pray. Jesus, uh, really right now, I really, really, really need your help on this. This is where my heart's at, Jesus. I'm pretty much desperate. I definitely, definitely, definitely want to sit here in this place and ask for great favor on the permit process, great favor for all the fire inspectors that walk in and they would look at our faces and they think, what a lovely bunch of people. Let me pass them and give them occupancy. I pray for favor. Bless the inspectors, God, right now. May, their, may your face shine upon them and may you give them these big, great, generous hearts when it comes to us, God. And, and <laughs> that there would be honey on us, there would be favor on us. Please, Jesus, we love you so much. Uh, and we trust you with this process. Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, thank you for that. That's really good. It's an important uh, thing to continue to remember to do in this time is to pray for these things. Uh, we are doing everything in our physical capability to uh, get over there. So that's good. And, and, and pray with us for sure for continued favor. Uh, and maybe we can spread the word for our final inspection when it's coming. And you guys could all be praying yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I'd be like, hey, if you don't pass us, then there's a lot of people praying and that's on you. So, a <laughs> little prayer threat. Uh, so, uh, we're really grateful for these times. And one thing I, I, uh, I talked with the gang about, and you can see it says it here, this book is yours. Respond in your way. Feel free to take notes, ask questions, write, draw, etc. Our hope is, as you take in this information, God will speak to you, and that this book will be a starting point, not an ending. Um, all, this book already has been a cooperative it's been something that not just came from me, but something that came from a collective of people uh, finding value in God's heart uh, for their life, for people around them, and for this community. So I would actually really think it'd be something a lot of fun is if you guys digested it, took notes on it, asked questions on it. And then if you wanted to, you could turn it in and then we could interact with your insights, with your thoughts, with your probes or questions. I'm big on uh, collaboration. I'm big on the conversation being so vitally important uh, for us. So feel free to interact on it. Feel free to ask questions on it, draw pictures on it, notes on it. Or if you have ideas in terms of contribution, uh, I'd love to hear about them. I love it so much. I've already gotten so much inf inspiration from people in community. Uh, so if you have any questions, you could text um, and if you have anything as far as input on the, the culture books concerned, then write them down because um, <clears throat> it's very much uh, a part of how we want to walk this out. Uh, we don't want to, as we've been talking about the last two months, be uh, a culture that is based on a king uh, publishing uh, the, uh, the culture and publishing all the things we're doing, but we want to be based on uh, co-creation and, and co-authoring co and cooperatives together. Uh, so if we take a look at our year in review and see what took place, there were some really exciting things that we talked about at our last uh, Mountain uh, Town Hall. And I think the kind of the, the crown jewel of it was uh, one week before, the opportunity for that building opened up to us. And it was a total miracle, totally amazing. And so we actually were able to uh, raise some money and buy into the ownership of that building uh, so we're a small minor owner on it. There's about $200,000 we were able to put into ownership on it. 
uh, which in that it was like a six-month turnaround from the time of having the opportunity to the time of um, being able to raise the funds to be able to invest in it, which puts us at like a 4% uh, ownership stake in it. Uh, which uh, to me is an absolute miracle, uh, less than a year in, to be able to have an opportunity uh, to own as a church entity. Uh, it's really exciting and really amazing. It's the beginning of what I think is a really important mindset in our community, which is ownership culture. Uh, we've been teaching the young, adult, uh, young adults on Thursday night, uh, and we've been doing like a lifestyle portion at the end. And the first week we talked to them about uh, the effort to save to own one day your own home rather than just rent. So ownership culture and ownership mindset has been really important for us uh, to pursue individually. Uh, I've, been t- I've been tracking with Gibran, who is uh, jumping into a completely new field with insurance. And I've been really, really excited about that prospect of business and the entrepreneurial aspects that he's been a part of and he's growing in. And I'm super excited about it. We were just catching up in the lobby. Uh, and just seeing these places of ownership are so vitally important. And it really changes the way we operate as a culture So I wanted to give you guys that kind of update on that. We were able to uh, finalize those things and to have an ownership stake on it, which I'm so grateful to God. And I really am like, wow. I just like, when it happened, it was finished. I was like, yeah, this is so exciting. And um, for me, it's the beginning of a beautiful story. I've been talking to a couple of people that want to church plant when it comes to, uh, there's one on, in the south, on the east coast, southeast coast, uh, Tim Roberson, actually, who was the pastor before me uh, here at the mountain, and he's looking to plant in the south. And so I told him about what we did as far as being able to do a, a promissory note and cultivate investments from people to be able to buy an ownership stake in a commercial building that you would then occupy as well and have other renters and such to subsidize the overall cost. And so he loved it, and I was like, you know, maybe it's something we could partner on and we could roll out for your community and we could champion that church plant in the south. And so there's a, there's a couple other prospective church planters that we want to partner with and that we've been connecting with and there may be church planters out of this place that we'd be able to champion and we'd be able to plant in a in a a really powerful way because the journey to ownership for a church is long and arduous Uh, and so if we can leapfrog some of those crazy places of having no place to call your home for other churches Uh, in their infancy, then I think we may be doing a really good thing. How many of you guys would agree with that? So that's what we experienced as far as the building ownership prospect, and we've finalized that. We've buttoned those things up, and I've been really excited, and I love those things. Um, And there's a couple other things that I learned over the last year that I thought were really important and that lead into kind of what we're talking about tonight, which is that we've seen the women's culture and community absolutely boom in this place. Have you guys noticed this? It's absolutely bonkers to me. I never anticipated it. In fact, it's completely atypical to how I would approach ministry, which is I always thought, you know what, let's just all get together. Why have men's group and women's group? Let's just all party together all the time and grow together all the time. And all of a sudden, within the mountain community, there was this explosion of the parts gathering together, whether it be women's or men's being like knocking on my door. Mark Cooper has been knocking on my door fervently for I don't know how long, like, hey, let me get in on this. Let me engage in this. Let me champion this. And Steve and George and such have done such an incredible job with the men. And, and all of a sudden I had to take a step back and go, okay, God, what are you doing in this community? And, and what am I missing? Because I didn't come up with this. I didn't see this taking place. But the community caught a vision. Community caught a value for something. And it's running with it. And it's really beautiful. And so as I began to take a step back, I began to realize uh, that something that has always happened in the time I've been in ministry and continues to happen now is that the power of vision is not just in the person holding the microphone, but the power of vision is in community. And this is atypical to a king culture, and it transitions us from this concept of there's one vision and then everybody else is supporting this one vision to Ephesians 4 talks about the parts, the fivefold ministry. You look at 1 Corinthians 12, and it talks about the diversity and the varieties of gifts. 
And it's really, really clear in Scripture that you have a part and an insight to God's nature that is unique and different from mine. And so while I'll champion, and maybe even my ideas are more known than others' ideas, there is a value in you having room in this place for God's design and purpose to flourish in you and through you. Uh, this, this kind of process has become almost an obsession for me uh, to cultivate, to champion, to mine the design and purpose of, of people around me and in community. Uh, it goes back to when I was in youth ministry, and this kid, Emmanuel Ramos, he Facebook messages me. I think that was the last time I was on Facebook. And he says to me, hey, man, let's do a lock-in. And I was like, that sounds cool, man. What is that? <laughs> and he's like, bro, what? You don't know what a lock-in is? And so then he began to tell me about it. He's like, it's this thing where the youth come, and we stay all night. And we stay up all night, and no one leaves until the morning. I was like, that sounds like a dumb idea, but let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> no better ideas in youth than dumb ideas. That's the ones you want to pursue. And, and guys, it was bananas. The first one was like 100 and change. I thought like 10 people would come, and they were going to be the ones that like you didn't really know what to say to, and they didn't know what to say to each other. So you're going to kind of all play like Scrabble or something. No, the first one had like 120 to 130 kids. The second one, guys, I was like, well, that was the high point, maybe 80. You know what I mean? And the next one, 350 people showed up to the next one. I think it actually was 400 young people. I literally felt like I, was, I lost a year of my life by the end of that night. I never stopped walking. Like, I went from one space to the next space. I was pretty much just making, trying to make sure no one was having sex. That was like, that was like success in my mind. It was like, if we could just not have anybody get pregnant by the end of this night, that would be awesome. <laughs> Everyone's like, dude, totally. <laughs> but it was, it was really cool because, like, that wasn't my vision. My role in that place was to just facilitate, cultivate, and cooperate with something that somebody saw in the community, and it brought life, it brought connection, it brought outreach. People got saved on those nights. People got loved on and championed on those nights, and maybe some people got a romantic connection. What's that? There you go. That's a testimony. <laughs> It was a good story for sure. I hit many a kids in the face with dodgeballs. I think I lost half of the youth group to dodgeball tournaments. Um, so those were good times. Uh, and the point is that um, one of some of the most beautiful things that will come out of this community will have nothing to do with the vision that I carry, but will be a vision that you carry. Um, I, uh, for about a year and a half, Tim and I connected and partnered on um, Honestly, health and healing in this culture and community before you really got plugged in and engaged. And, and he's probably brought it up, and you've heard it before. Uh, he, he functions in ministry called Heart Freedom, and it's really amazing. But, uh, you know, we went to coffees for I don't know how long before he, like, substantially got involved on a staff level with the mountain. Was it, like, over a year where you were pretty much, yeah, like, like, interviewing <laughs> me to see if I was trustworthy? It was a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, like, a year and a half, and then it hit him and the and the... The idea, the point was we were building a relationship to cooperate together and to co-author in his space. Because God put a value and a vision on his life to minister freedom and to minister healing that was unique to him. It was different than mine. And so I, I really saw my role at that point was to make room. And we literally, in the next building, we have a heart freedom room. And so we literally made room. And it's like, hey, look, this is, this is the heart freedom room. Others can use it. But this is your room. Go for it. Design it how you want. Furnish it how you want. What do you need for, for people's hearts to be free in this community? Uh, how can we partner with you? How can we facilitate it? Similarly with Roz and Love My City, uh, she's been doing a phenomenal job of reaching out to the city. And she set up a meeting that I went to recently where we were exploring advanced and more involved ways to love our city. And it's about making my head explode. 
We want to do a Love My City building chapter downtown or somewhere in this city with the vision of that Love My City chapter extending to other cities where its primary purpose is to facilitate outreach, not only for this church, but for any church and any people in this city for the city. Because as you may or may not know, a love for a city has to be intentionally cultivated in a community. So it doesn't come be, become a kumbaya session where we're just all, you know, hugging each other and then we get out there and honk our horns at people going down the road. So this was look, vision coming out of Roz to love our city well. Vision coming out of Tim to minister and nurture people's hearts for freedom. And there's another one that's kind of like in its grassroots right now, which is our creative expression in this community uh, and Beth and Scott Little, who have been a part of this community since I think like the third or fourth week I was here. Uh, and she's an artist and she's had a studio in town. And one day she was like, yeah, my studio time's up there. And we had another room that was kind of undefined up there. And I was like, well, why don't you just have your studio here and then we'll cultivate creativity. We'll cr cultivate the arts out of this place here. And you'll not only have a place for you to do your own personal art, but you'll also be able to champion artists in this community, creatives in this community. She's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah. Just don't tell the rest of the team that I gave you this room yet. <laughs> Just give me a sec to tell them. <laughs> and, you know, we figured it out with the team, and all of them were really excited about it. And uh, so she's got her studio there, but she's championing the creative arts in this place. She's championing creativity in this place, which in our community, there's been a word of creative renaissance. There's been a word of creativity that's been on this community. And you can see it, I think, thriving in our worship. When you have, guys, we have more worshipers than I can, it's insane. It's really insane. We have these incredible team and incredible people and just they're awesome. Uh, and we have way more than we should have for the size of our church. Uh, but it's because we say yes to creative people. We say yes to the chaos that creativity brings. Because it really does bring a degree of chaos creativity you know it's like whoa look at all these new things what do we do um, and all this to say is uh, is our our primary purpose in this place is to go okay all of these growing buddy budding things what do we do we've seen the prophetic really really rising and thriving we've seen all of the different parts really pressing in on this thing including teaching and such so the question then becomes and I've been getting it a lot it is is, okay, how do we organize and how do we structure this thing? We've got this great premise of love Jesus, love people. Where do we go from here? Are we going to get organized at some point? I go, that's a great question. And so uh, it actually started to stress me out a little bit because gift of administration I do not have. And, uh, and so one morning, though, I woke up and it really dawned on me that love wasn't just a sentiment, but it was also the highest order of things and I woke up and I really clearly recalled, I felt like the Lord recalled to me in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, which really simply says, but earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. And the still more excellent way introduces the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. And I was like, that's it. These are our core values. And this is the realization that love isn't just a sentiment, but it also governs. And if you, we wrote it all down because it was a pretty involved concept in my opinion, but when you begin to understand love as, as governing, you can kind of start to see that it shows up in our core values, but it shows up in a contrast from a king or hierarchical order to a place of love empowering, championing, creating boundary, creating the rights and the wrongs clarity. And then when it says God is love, if you really are truly operating in love, you begin to understand that it sets in order our behavior and how we approach or relate to one another. And just to be clear, our core values, as realized in 1 Corinthians 13, because I was like, here it is. The starting point for our core values will be love values seen in Scripture. And this may or may not be the end of our core values, but it's definitely the beginning and we like five because five is just nice. You know what I mean? It's just like five, right? Let's do five. But it, And uh, you can kind of see them and study them out on your own. But just as a reference, it's without love, power is meaningless, which you can see this recognized and realized in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 2. And it says, sacrifice without love is empty, 1 Corinthians 13, 3. Love makes room, like I just talked about, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5. 
Love champions truth, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, and love produces righteousness, John 14, 15, and 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. And as I begin to realize that structure, yeah, it's totally needed, it's totally coming. There's already a degree of structure, there always kind of is. But the intentionality, where we go and why, what, what boundaries we operate in and why, uh, what are our do's and don'ts that we have realized and or discovered in relationship? These are things that are actually understood and revealed in a loving relationship with God and a lo- loving relationship with people. That the consequence of a love relationship with God actually sets in order our behavior. It sets in order how we interact with one another. And, and if we're really speaking to what the structure is, it's a family structure. Yeah. It's not a hierarchical structure, it's a family structure. And the word is really clear and fleshes out in a lot of profound ways what a family culture looks like. We've been preaching on it for the last two months, so I'm not going to preach tonight. We can reference those things. And, uh, And then as we begin to realize the beauty that love actually governs, love structures, love organizes us, I I began to see that it was really important to partner with community and leadership on how we engage you and what your role or part is in all of this. And so we started to come up with some language and terminology for this, and Tim's going to jump in at this point as well. And again, a reminder, if you have any questions on any of this, you can text uh, up there, not that, that that right there. And um, and you can text that for any questions relating to this or otherwise, and we're going to jump in and engage with those at some point in this process. But as we began to realize the value of the way love behaves in community, I began to understand that how we explore, engage, activate people is important. Uh, And to do it in a loving way is really meaningful to me. Um, Tim and I, for a year and a half, partnered together to, to understand His design and purpose, not only in his life, he knew a lot of that already because of his maturity, but his design and purpose in this community. And that was a journey together where we went on a a journey of exploring and discovering his design and purpose in the mountain space or outside of it. And uh, this is something that I do with our church staff. Anybody on staff they may or may not know it by name, but I always am engaging with them on an up-to-date design and purpose. Because oddly enough, people change, and their, 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 their passions shift, their maturities shift, and, they, and sometimes it makes it clear what they were always meant to be and do in community, uh, and sometimes it convolutes it a little bit, and you've got to partner well there. But the beautiful, loving, fathering and mothering relationship in community has us asking questions like, what is your design and purpose? Not just what is the post or assignment or need that this community has. Like, hey, let's get you in children's because there's a need. It's not just what's our need, can you fill it? It's, yeah, there's an understanding of need, and sometimes people fill it for a time and a season. But ultimately, we want to engage, explore, and understand everybody's design purpose and partner with it. What's it look like? How does it show up here? How does it show up in the city? And so, uh, Tim, uh, we, and we coined the phrase of it, discovery journey, and I, yeah. I wanted to have Tim share on this discovery journey. Part of the reason it took us a year and a half is because I was coming out of an old wineskin of, well, what do you need? Like, I'm in. My heart is invested. I want to help. Where do you need help? I'll do that. And so the conversations we were having, <laughs> he kept asking me, what do I want to do? And I'm like, well, there's a lot of things I want to do, but what do we need at Mountain and rather than having such a need-based um, structure or, or way of operating, it, it was, okay, who has God sent us? Like, what are the gifts that are sitting in the seats every Sunday? How do we discover that? How do we draw that out? And how do we activate that so that people are operating in the design and purpose that God has put inside of them? And, and it really was, um, it, it took me about 18 months to figure out, you know, what conversation we were having. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it took that long. <laughs> I think it was a journey of discovery together. <laughs> but what, what we want to do, what we want to do is, as a body at the mountain is we want to partner with you and each and every person that comes and attends and is involved to take you together on a discovery journey. And what that looks like is discovering the ways that God has created and designed us. As, as David said in Psalm 139, he says, um, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, 
for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, you need to understand, we were created in the image of God. And it wasn't like a cookie-cutter stamp that God put on every human ever created. There is such a uniqueness to every person God has ever created. I mean, when you look at the fact that 7 billion people on the planet, no two people have the same fingerprints. Like, th there's a uniqueness. There's, you could use your, your retina as a security ID because your eyes are different than anybody else on the planet. If we were to take a microscopic speck of your DNA, we would know that you are not the same as someone else because of the uniqueness that God has designed intentionally into us. If there's such intentionality in that uniqueness of design, then how have we spent 2,000 years as a church trying to cram people into this cookie-cutter mold of what a Christian looks like or how they serve or what they do or what offices they'll hold in the church? And it's like, God, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to build? What are you trying to do? And just recently, as a matter of fact, Pam started me on this journey. She, she was doing some research, and she said, you know, everyone's voice is uniquely identifiable. I know you can kind of sound like somebody else, but if you broke it down and you, you put it through technology, they would be able to accurately identify, no, that voice is different from every other voice on the planet. And when you start talking about a voice level, when God spoke the world into existence and you were created in the image of God, that your voice brings something into a situation that no other person on the planet can bring into a situation, it tells me God's really trying to do something here. So a discovery journey is to dis discover what has God done in you? What is the gift and ability he's put inside you? And that looks like, um, like discovering what my design is through my personality. You know, I've shared before how when Pam and I did personality tests when we first got married, it was like a game changer because it's like, okay, they're not a freak. That's kind of how God wired them. I can accept that because this is God's design in them. It's not something that I need to like harass them out of. Uh, not that we don't need to like modify ourselves sometimes out of love because love governs, but Finding out what kind of personality do I have? Because it's the worst thing in the world. Have you ever been in a job that is so not suited for your personality? And it feels like I would rather shove razor blades under my fingernails than go back to that place and clock in one more day. That's the kind of thing that I don't believe God created us for. I believe he created us for passion and purpose and to come alive in the things that we do. So discovering what is the personality God's given me. And then what are the gifts and abilities that he's put inside of me? You know, he sent each of us as a gift to community. There is something inside of you that I need in my life because I don't have it. There is something inside of me. There's something inside of Sam. There's something inside of the person sitting next to you. God designed specifically that you need because you don't have that part. Not all the parts are the same. We're different, and we bring those unique things together to build something greater than the whole. And then discovering what are the areas of passion? What are the things that make you come alive? What has God put in you that delights you? You know, if, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. I believe that's pointing specifically to something just like the discovery journey of what are the desires of your heart that God has planted there? Not just things that we've seen in the world and like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I want that. Like, you see a car, and you're like, wow, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I want that car. No, I'm talking about what comes alive from the inside. When, when I get to operate in or do or participate in, or I get to bring to the table. It's like, wow, this is really fulfilling. We want to help you discover those places in your life and in your heart. And, and then what season are you in? What is God doing in your life in this time frame that you're in right now? Because as Sam said before, people change, times change, seasons change. So we're not trying to shove you into a box that this is where you're going to live the rest of your life until the day you die, you're going to do this thing. No, what is God saying to you in this season? We want to partner in that journey so that we're, we're hearing the heart of heaven for each and every person that he has given to us, that he sent us to be a part of the family. And then that'll lead us to places of growth. What, what does my spiritual and emotional health affect my effort? And that's where... Um, where inner healing, that's where places of deliverance, places of growing, places of transformation come in. We want to partner in this journey so that we can draw out of each and every person God has sent to us the real gift that he designed and created them to be. Now, that might seem a little bit intimidating because it's not going to look the same for everybody. You know, I think a lot of years I thought I, it needs to be in the church. I need to be like on a platform. I need to be teaching or preaching or leading something in order to really serve and please God. But there are so many things that God has for us to do in the world, at your workplace, in your community, at your kid's school, at, in your kid's uh, sports games. He is pouring things inside of you that, that are going to minister to those around you, bring life to those around you. And it doesn't look like what we're doing right now on a microphone or on a platform. 
So we're really, really excited about engaging with you in this process. And um, in the next uh, month, month and a half, we're going to start rolling this out, and we're going to have people signing up to be able to take the personality test, the gifts test, to sit down and talk with a cultivator that's going to ask some questions, just have a discussion, hopefully not 18 months discussion. We're, I think we've distilled it down a little bit, so like we're a little bit closer to what God's looking for. But we want to partner with you in that. We want to help serve you in that way and in that place of discovery, that journey of discovery of what exactly God has put in you and created you for so that you can live in that passion. And some things will, will take longer to hatch depending on what the, the collective or the cooperative is. Yeah. Uh, for example, Roz, when we were talking the other day, she's like, can we do this program? I was like, you know, I mean, we could do that. Um, but what I think I'd actually really like to start praying on too is, is searching and praying for real estate that would, would place us in a really, really appropriate spot to do outreach uh, and to, to buy a certain uh, amount of real estate, to buy a certain amount of uh, building expression that would allow us to operate in this space and rent out the rest to cover costs, et cetera, et cetera, things like that. So that cooperative will take time. You know, it'll take searching. It'll take a real estate agent in this church uh, and or such finding something and then uh, maybe somebody buying something or maybe us raising something. Uh, you know, I don't know all of the details of how it will unfold, but it, you start to kind of get a gauge on what God is doing in somebody in community. And then you start to try and really partner with it well. And this all stems back to an, a concept for me that I've explored and understood in ministry, which is God builds his church. This much has been so, like basically a scientific fact to me. Uh, it's really weird. I came to the mountain and Tim was here. I had no idea when I met Tim who for sure looked and kind of reminded me of the Tim that was Roberson. <laughs> I was like, did he leave a carbon copy spy of himself? That's, or? Why, I kept, that's why I kept the beard. Yeah, people are like. <laughs> I was like, this is eerie and awesome. Uh, but it's like uh, he was here. You know, and there's, there's so many things that were, were already here when I got here. I had zero idea they were going to be the things that would flourish uh, and that, that all I needed to do in terms of my role was be intentional to love people well to have enough of a care and interest in what God was doing in the community, not just in me, that I can convince everybody to follow me on, but what is God doing in the community that I can go, ooh, that's so good. Yes. Hey, everybody, look at that. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Or maybe nobody looks at it, and it's outside of these four walls. Maybe it's a business group, an entrepreneurial concept. Uh, maybe it's a cooperative, which is something that I have absolutely been studying on uh, with the team and such is, can we do cooperatives from church to business, uh, to people wanting to start businesses? Can we create these cooperatives? Can we begin to field these ideas of being able to invest in people, to being able to invest in businesses and share a partial ownership of said businesses so the church can diversify its income, it can invest in people and see dreams take off because some great ideas are just a little bit of partnership away from yeah. really taking off. Um, and so I, I'm of this heart and mindset like, well, this is what I think God has placed in us as a unique design in our community that I think could be a testament to others seeing, hearing, or listening to what we're doing, which is that we want to make uh, a real intentional focus of cooperating with what God is doing in the people in our community. Some of it's going to be ministry visions. Some of it's going to be business cooperatives. I wrote notes on things I would love to see. I'm like, from these places of discovery, I would like to discover and partner with people that our partnership would help yield millionaires. I mean, that's one of my dreams, that, that out of this cooperative business partnership, that we could see somebody become a millionaire as a result of said business starting in cooperation. We're taking volunteers for the millionaire spot. That's right. That's right. Are you wanting to be on the list? <laughs> and this is, this is something that I think would just be so amazing. You know, when, when Gibran was jumping into the insurance field and stuff, I was racking my brain. I'm like, how can I cooperate? How can I help? What can I do? Because... My interest isn't just for the, the church's business interest to be advanced. It's for the interest of community to be advanced as well. Does this make sense? 
And it's a little bit of a shift from a, a one-person focal point to a community-driven focal point that thrives in cooperatives, that coaches cooperation, that coaches collectives, that coaches these mindsets of understanding and cooperating with one another. And hopefully that's what we can model in a leadership way is cooperating with people in their spaces of business, in their spaces of ministry interest, in their spaces of whatever their design and purpose ends up being revealed to be. It's like Rachel came up to me and she's like, hey, in the new building, can we have like a creative space in the sanctuary? I was like, you know what? I got a perfect spot. It's when you're looking out, it's right to the right. Like I could put 20 green chairs there or blue or whatever color these are. But really, that's kind of awkward. You know what I mean? So, yeah, let's make it a creative space. We'll put a table there and we'll have ability for people to create during services. Maybe we'll throw some easels next to it. It's right by the sound booth which I'm so sorry, Nick, and everyone that's going to do sound, but the sound booth is to the side. So you'll have to remotely mix the sound on an iPad sitting in the seat back there. But I was like, yeah, let's do it. That sounds great. That sounds awesome. Let's partner in that space. What do you see? It's a very simple thing, but let's do it. Ashley came to me the other day. She's like, I got an idea. We were talking. This is not the other day. The other day is like basically it could be two years ago. It could be six minutes ago, guys. The other day is abroad. Like, I haven't seen you in a minute. Could be nine years. So she comes to me, and she's like, and we're talking about the design of the new space and stuff. She's like, I got this idea for the back wall. And so she shared it with me. I'm like, let's do it. And she's like, okay, well, and she kept referring it to it as my wall. Like, what do you want to do with your wall and stuff? I was like, Ashley, it's our wall. It's our stage background. It's ours, you know, like, this is ours, and I don't know if I've still convinced her at all yet that it's ours. So if I'm everybody gets it. to put their own graffiti tag on it, like we could really take ownership oh, yeah. of the stage wall. Tag that thing for sure. <laughs> and so, oh, we got questions rolling in here. Do you have any questions that you want to answer? Yeah, uh, on the businesses, because we just talked about that, the uh, question of how will the church filter through what businesses they actually want to partner with? Mm-hmm. Like, what would that look like? Is there a, a criteria um, yeah, yeah, somebody said no, uh, yeah, no strip clubs, but, um, <laughs> which is true, but, but the ultimate reality is, is that, uh, of course, we wouldn't partner in a business that was beneath the character level appropriate or the holiness standard, yeah. uh, so no shady business, so no shady entrepreneurial concepts and such, and also, this wouldn't really be for me about cultivating greed, or cultivating money-making opportunities and such. Um, So this is a part of... I think there's a great doorway there, too, because I think a lot of times, in my mind, as a young man in my 20s, I made a conscious decision to separate the business world from ministry or my life with God. And I really laid down an entrepreneurial gift that God had put inside of me because I thought I had to choose one or the other. That absolutely was not the case. That was, a, that was a tradition of man that I picked up. God has put things inside of people that bring value to others. And when you bring a good value to others, there's an exchange of value that happens, and that's how businesses ought to operate. It's not talking people out of their stuff or talking people out of their money. It's offering them something of value that's needed or wanted or desired that, that can be a holistic, a godly thing. And when that exchange of value happens, so that sort of thing, like being able to teach and and um, operate in that understanding, laying a foundation of understanding for God's people that that business is not a sin. It's it's not about getting into other people's pockets. It's about making their lives better by bringing value to them. And what would that business look like? And those are the things that we probably would be looking at. Does this bring value to people? Does this bring value to others? Then that might be something we could possibly invest in. Yeah. And, and I think it's something that the development of this would be putting together uh, different oversight uh, groups and different people to be a part of the decision-making process. Uh, one thing I understand and I have come to really, really value is the different giftings and expertise in this community. And there's a lot of folks in the seats right now and on sitting in there on Sundays that are much better businessmen than I am, that are much better entrepreneurs than I am, and have had and or learned a lot from it. And so to me, first steps would look like gathering people that would be able to uh, partner well, pray on, have discernment on, and make great decisions. Uh, 
about said opportunities or said cooperatives and partnerships. So to me, it would look like building a team of people that would uh, review, that would look into, that would cooperate and or decide on what we cooperate with and what we don't cooperate with. Uh, and that we just either support with advice or input or love and prayer or even sometimes just feedback. Some business ideas come back really, really raw and really, really unhatched and really, really not prepped well. And so sometimes the partnership at that point looks like giving great feedback teaching them how to build a resume or get industry expertise and such. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So to me, it looks like gathering people that would be really sound in this community to champion those places. And it would look a lot probably like trying to find someone to operate in community, like to serve in a, in a leadership position or function. Like what is God breathing on their life? It, it's gonna, this is going to be such a Holy Spirit-driven process. There's not going to be like a set of criteria like when you go to the Small Business Association and you – you know, you check, the, you check the things off the list and, oh, you qualify. No, it's like, what is God saying over this person's life or this person's business? Mm -hmm. it, God is going to have to lead into those places in order for us to partner with. And, like, it's going to have to be so apparent to leadership and, and to community that, yeah, God's in this. I think it's something that we should step into with them and partner with them in. So um, wherever God le God's heart has to lead out on all of that yeah. rather than just business. The next person. question related to business is what if multiple people want to pursue the same business? Uh, then oh, we have a match. fight to the finish. The chair cage match. That's right. Whoever wins gets out. No. Uh, to me, uh, agreements, contracts, and all of the different things that could be authored or cultivated from that place would be a part of the discussion. If many different people are coming into that space with an idea or a concept for the same thing, then partnership may be in place. Uh, that a shared ownership group of collective of people from the community may be in place. And being able to explore and understand and see if that's a possibility or not, I think would be part of the journey yeah. for it. Absolutely. And I think that's part of breaking the poverty mentality of there's only so much to go around and I've got to get a bigger market share or, or like we're taking it away from others. My whole prayer, and our, my, my wife and I own a business, my whole prayer is that God will bless our industry to such a degree we can't handle it all and that we yeah. need more people to get into our industry. Yeah. Like that all of the business that we're competing against would do so well, we'd have so much business that everyone is doing well, if yeah. that makes sense. But not as well as you. <laughs> but, no, I, I don't want all, there are people doing, doing way really more well. than we can do and we couldn't handle that level of business like in our lives right now. So it's like, what is God's heart for this yeah. type of business yeah. or industry? That's what we want to bring in. This is the different, the heart of heaven into business is completely different look. Like love is the, the biggest business principle you can possibly operate by. And that's not something that's taught in business schools. That's not something I think most Christian entrepreneurs or business people operate in or are aware of. But that's a foundational business principle is love. So breaking off that, that poverty or that lack or scarcity mentality, and like Sam was saying, getting people to cooperate together. Maybe they go in on a partnership and they do it together. Or maybe they pray for and with each other and they, and they head off into their different sectors in the same industry. But they, they love and they serve one another in that rather than trying to knock each other out so they can get more for themselves. Like it's mm -hmm. a transformational journey. Sorry, I'm not passionate about that at all. No, so. this is, I, I love this. And honestly, at any given point, you see things that you're like, I would love to be a part of that. Uh, then come talk to us. Uh, it, it, right now, it's on an informal or an organic level of discussion and conversation and beginning to explore these concepts. They're really unique to create and or propose cooperatives between a church and people in the community is very unique from what I've heard and experience. I don't know that it's the first time ever, but it's unique. Uh, and so in this unique uh, pursuit and adventure together, we can learn a lot, we can find a lot of wisdom, and there's a lot of people that have done cooperatives, a lot of expertise, and I would love to have those people a part of uh, determining and discerning which ones should be uh, cultivated, partnered with, discerned, uh, and or determined which ones we should partner with. And uh, this is maybe putting together a team of experts or professionals, accountant, attorney, insurance that can advise and be a resource. Absolutely. If you have experience in a field, um, you know, people are starting to get a business off the ground. They don't know about bookkeeping. They don't know about the licensing process. They don't know about all the things, the hoops you have to jump through. So if you have uh, an understanding of that and you want to participate, you can put your name down. We're gonna, this is, more structure is going to be coming later. We're not going to put it together tonight. But, yes, we absolutely want to draw from as many people as we can for wisdom and insight for that. And then also, well, this is very important, under love governs, we have kings, servants, fathers, sons, and heirs, but where are the mothers? We left the mothers out of the book. I have to answer? I, I didn't write that part. Mine was the back page. 
It's like when the Bible refers to man, he created them male and female and called them man. Um, it, it's an understanding. Like when we say sons, I always say and daughters because I understand it's not just talking to the men. Uh, because we're all created in God's image and equal in God's sight. So when we talk about a fathering mentality, we're also talking about mothering mentality. So it's fathering and mothering. Those go hand in hand. And it's the aspect that God has put inside of you as a man or a woman, as a father or as a mother. Those are the things that we want to draw out. So when you see that language, um, I just want you to go ahead and assume that the mothers and daughters are a part of that as well. And then uh, in line with there's a lot of business questions coming in, which is really exciting because I think that there's there's some fun heat on this. So have you all thought about having a business directory at the church, like list of people who have businesses? We have thought about that. We could put it on the wall. (laughs) We could put it on the brick wall. (laughs) On Ashley's, uh, this Ashley's brick wall. So we got to determine whether or not we could have it up there. Ashley, do you approve (laughs) business directory up there on another wall? Okay, on another wall. Um, but yeah, we have thought about that. Um, uh, some, probably my interest is in not only people knowing about what other businesses are in church that they could utilize for things, although I do think that's a, a worthy venture, but it's also cultivating, uh, growing and developing. That's probably where my mindset goes, but I'm definitely not against collecting said existing businesses information and having that available to people. Um, we just haven't hatched it yet. We've been trying to get into that building. Let's just blame it on that. (laughs) Um, So what would the approval rejection process of the business partnership look like? Is there a criteria for the businesses applying? There is not a criteria currently. There is not a rubric in place currently. Um, And right now, uh, we would like to develop and put together uh, the people that would help to cultivate and to partner with it. Um, we are definitely interested in two things. One, if you want to be a part of helping develop these things, we'd love your help. And then two, if you have a business that you have an interest in developing and need cooperation, whether it be wisdom, feedback, uh, investment, or such, come talk to us. Uh, and we can sit down and we can connect with you. Can we hear about your ideas? We can hear about the direction you want to go. Uh, and at the very least, we can connect you with somebody that may have uh, an interest in helping and or feedback or great expertise in the area. You'd be surprised the amount of expertise in this building uh, on any given Sunday. It's really vast and amazing. The questions are jumping around. The questions are jumping around, but we have a couple of, like, basic ones. What is needed for Easter at the park? Set up and tear down are kind of always the ones. Uh, and then bring your side. Uh, Peach Cobbler will be here, hopefully. Uh, that's always my one request every year. We need face painters, babe. Face painters, volunteers to watch the bounce house. And we All actually sorts. have a sign-up sheet out there tonight if that's something you're interested in being yep. part of. Yep. Um, and what are gifts, expertise, are the biggest needs, gaps you're currently feeling? Uh, children seems to be the eternal uh, kind of need youth so so our young people from under 18 years old the partnership with those things they seem to always kind of be I mean if you've been a part of church culture for longer than six days you've probably seen a need in those places Uh, so if you've got uh, uh, like literally a Sunday a month or a Sunday a year Uh, It doesn't have to be every week. It could be on a really, really infrequent basis. But we love to see people uh, championing our young people. So that is, I think, one of the higher needs. Uh, When it comes to the care uh, and and partnering or reaching out to people, those are are huge needs always. Um, Media is always a big need. Media. You like my hair? You like that? Thank you so much. Yeah, because then I start to, you know. You always know Samson his creative process because he does this swirl. Sometimes he does that on a Sunday morning and he gets this funky, like, shark head. (laughs) That's why I just shave it off because people will make fun of it. (laughs) Uh, They say we need help in media, sound projection, slides, social media, et cetera. Um, There's always all kinds of fun things that can be done and needed. There's the beginnings of things and the ends of things as far as the fullness of it. So connect with us uh, at any point in the lobby or sign up for anything that's currently available. And then we'll always be kind of presenting opportunities to love our city or our church well through different teams. What is the plan for the equipment, furniture, stage, all this stuff, moving it? So from one Sunday to the next, we have six days to move everything. And we don't know which Sunday yet. 
And we don't know which Sunday yet, which is the most but fun it's out part. There. That's the adventure of it, guys. This is this wouldn't be fun if we knew all the information. Uh, and we could plan months out on how to move and everything like that. Lucky for us, it's just right there. So Jason Douglas wants all of us on that last Sunday to pick up a chair and walk it over there. That's his vote. He's like, come on, guys, we got to do this. And I'm like, I don't know. What about, you know, Grandma Kathy or whatnot? And do we really want to ask her to pick up a chair and but stuff? But we do have a and chair, Dolly. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with grandmas. You're a grandma. Come on, you're strong. You're strong. <laughs> hey, chairs, come on. We're going to put my mom in charge of chairs. You're the... <laughs> we... <laughs> And then, of course, Carrie is in charge of where we're going to go if we don't have a place to go, which is one of the questions. Um, uh, honestly, so that doomsday scenario uh, is what if we don't have this or that yet, you know, and after Easter, that's not ready. Uh, then, honestly, we're probably going to land at a park and have church in the park. Uh, we will communicate these things with great diligence and great fervor if they are happening to us. And I will put a smile on, and we will have fun, and it will be great, and I won't be disappointed. And then nobody wants to come back to the building because the park was so cool. I know. They're going to be like, let's Kids do are that be like, every There's week. A playground. It's so much fun. And hot dogs. Yeah, yeah, totally. The kids will be like, this was the best Sunday ever. <laughs> yeah. Can we have a class on healthy financial habits for personal life and business owners to better increase the financial health of the community? Yes. That sounds great to me. Let's do it. Sign up to teach that in the lobby. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I know it sounds sometimes like we're saying, like, okay, great. Like, who's going to do it? And a part of championing and, and having people own the space and community is really seeing champions rise. Yeah. People grabbing the torch and bearing it in community and running with it and us going, yes, this is awesome. How can we support, nurture, uh, champion what God has put inside of you for community? Um, and um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, the sign-up sheet is in the lobby if you want to help move. Vincent told me that right there. Can we have a testimony night? We would all get to know each other better. And how or when the person sharing found God, what is their passion, drive, or goal in the body of the Lord? I haven't heard many testimonies. This is really good. Uh, so I actually was just talking about this with some of the staff and such. And I was like, hey, here's the thing is I've kind of said, I've kind of moved away from a certain classic way we tell testimonies, which is like, hey, man, you got 30 seconds to tell us the most pivotal thing that's ever happened in your life. Ready? Go. And it's got to always kind of have some kind of ending that everyone can kind of like clap at. And then sometimes you get a random person that's like, hey, my life fell apart, but I'm believing for a miracle. That's my testimony. And you're like, whoa, that's, that's not a testimony. <laughs> We love you, process. and we're going to pray with you now, but you're still in the process. Uh, and so all this to say, I want people to be able to hear people's stories of what Jesus has done in their life. Um, I don't know that the format we've done it in is the most optimal. So I would like to identify and find a more optimal way for us to tell the incredible narrative stories that God is doing in our lives. Home groups is powerful, for sure. And sometimes there is a communication from this space of microphone that is effective and is meaningful. Um, I haven't created a rubric on what should be here or in home groups or to just your friends and family. I imagine there is some kind of qualifying narrative evaluation and or just God doing something in your life. And we go, I love that. Let's share with people. Uh, and then also, I've noticed, and I actually have a real strong passion to capture people's stories in a longer form than the 30 seconds that the microphone allows during a service. And I would love to see podcast interviews of people's lives and what God has done in it, where you can hear that 60 to 90 minute journey. Yeah. I mean, like I, I went to... Um, Jess and I, we went to lunch with Tyler and Lisa over here, and we got to share life with one another. And we got to share our stories of what God has been doing or the, the struggles and the passions and the fun and the excitement, the hopes, the dreams, the miseries. And we got to share our story, but it wasn't like, quick, you got 30 seconds and go. It was like we ate together. We spent time together. We heard each other's stories 
So I think when it comes to what God is doing in people's life, I would love for people to experience it in its full, beautiful version. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I know there's a part of it that's like, okay, well, practically, how does that unfold? And that's a great question, and I'd like to explore it in a long form and see what value there is over short form, because there is a value at times. And what's that look like? How do we field those stories? I'm definitely open to stories being heard. It's a lot about fielding it and seeing what stories should be shared when, where, and how, and why. And the impact it has on people is meaningful. But I really, really want to capture long-form narrative journeys of what God has done in people's life over a podcast where you could actually talk about the moment when God saved you, what happened, and the moment when your heart was broken and how God ministered to you. And you don't have to have like a clean ending at the end of your sentence. It can be part of the journey of what God is continuing to do and you could talk about it. I've got a lot of thought on this because I love narrative. I love stories. Um, but, uh, but I really want to see it done in a more full way. Um, we've got some more questions, and we'll probably end here pretty soon, probably just a few minutes. But is the joy wreath coming to the new building with us? That's this guy right here. It's been up since Christmas. It's haunted my wife, Jessica. Is that your question, babe? Every Sunday she comes in here, she goes, oh, it's still up. I I forgot to take it down. I think we should leave it here and see if the new owner realizes it. <laughs> Joy is here whether you like it or not. <laughs> we left it for you. Uh, somebody asked if the fifth Goulet child is on the way. That might be a question for no, Jessica. absolutely not. She's shaking her head. We're in agreement. Um, I think we're good. I think God's done a good thing, and I think we're good right now. We say yes, amen, and it is finished. <laughs> Can we do trainings, discussions, share resources, or some small group discussion on mental health issues, substance use issues, homelessness issues, real stuff? I love that. Let's do it. There are a lot of things, not just this, but uh, financial training, this stuff right here that was just talked about, and many other things that uh, I've put my eyeballs on, like, I'd love to train, equip, and disciple people in these spaces. So I think some of it will show up in home groups. Some of it will show up in some seminars, summits, conferences, things of that nature. In our future, I see places of bringing in speakers and such. Uh, we actually had a few speakers scheduled, and then COVID hit. Uh, and then we're like, cool, awesome. So there's not going to be any speakers in this place. There's not even going to be a crowd. Ha <laughs> ha. So that was fun. So um, I'm thinking if we go to schedule some speakers, then something else will happen, you know. No, but uh, that is definitely part of our plans and our dreams. Uh, we've been thrown into a crisis in terms of building crisis from basically the beginning of our, of our church entity beginning. Uh, within 30 days of us becoming our own entity about a year and a half ago, uh, we got a notice that we were probably going to have to get out of the building within 45 days. Uh, and, of course, we didn't. Uh, as you can see now, we're still here. Um, but we got thrown into that mix right away. And so it was like fight to survive, thrive This somehow. is like an annual theme. We get kicked out every year. Yep. And sometimes okay. we stay and sometimes we have to get <laughs> yep. out. We always get a notice every year. It's an annual tradition, unlike any other. And so we've been in this mix, and a lot of our effort has gone to securing a home that has stability and security on it. And we're really, really close. Yeah. We're really, really close. I've got optimism on it, but most of the time I have optimism. Could we have a page or a link on our website that had a collection of testimonies and faith-empowering stories that, God, that people can go to bolster their God journey? Yes. So many people have said this, and I say yes. Uh, and actually, just in our last one of our last staff meetings, I'm like, why don't we just put a ton of our media effort behind this? Capture podcasts, videos, the whole nine yards, written posts, the whole thing, so people can see and experience the stories of what God is doing in people's lives. You guys into that? Yeah. I think we're realizing it's like a really big thing and a really important thing, and we gotta we gotta really prioritize it. Are there any questions? Yeah, questions about prophetic, questions about prayer. You, one of the things, part of what discovery is going to do is, is most churches pick like one gift or a couple of gifts 
and they major on those areas of influence, whether it's the prophetic or whether it's evangelism, whether it's an apostolic call. One of the things that Sam has done a really good job of trying to do is to make room for all of the gifts that God has presented and all the gifts that God has created. And that can take time and that can, you know, we're waiting for those those gifts to present themselves and to God, God to breathe on it, God put his hand on it. But we do actively currently right now, we have a plan in motion to uh, bring the prophetic more to the forefront, uh, to do some training and equipping, to, to do some teaching on that and, and prayer as well. Um, so those, those are things that are in development. Those are things that we're working on. There are people identified to help bring those things to the forefront right now. There's a couple of questions here. Upper room night, still an opportunity. Conferences and retreats, prayer team, prayer intercession, the prophetic. Uh, they're they're kind of all lumped into almost one initiative that has, uh, unfortunately, from the last town hall till now, um, it's been developing in terms of people and individual meetings or group meetings, but it hasn't really, other than our house, Houses of Acts last summer, which will also be doing a House of Acts summer homes scene, um, we haven't started an upper room uh, service, uh, or, <clears throat> yeah, we haven't started that and or the prayer nights, um, and a, a lot of it has actually been the logistics of doing that. It's been really, really immersive. It's, it's been a big tax uh, for me and for the community, so it's kind of... Uh, almost put a lot of things as a not yet but will be uh, an expression and or a, a, a very intentional cultivation. And also, I have this really, so I'm a pastor, of, I'm, a, I'm a pastor with a, uh, I'm a father of four kids. Uh, I was also a pastor's kid. Uh, and so when it comes to a growing community, which we are, which means things like a third service, larger sanctuary, more home groups, more staff, more people, more conferences, more retreats, more seminars, more ministries. All of a sudden, you're like, whoa, that's a, okay, all right. Um, I, 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 um, and so I, there's this tension for me, uh, the human, the father, um, the father of four kids. There's this tension for me, which is... Um, I can make short-term ambition uh, acts, and uh, and then uh, I can I can lose my family in the journey of prioritizing short-term church growth ambition. Yeah. 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 And so I have this conversation with a lot of people. You know, Steve and I, I we go to coffees and we talk about it. Like, okay, how do I, as one of the leaders and pastors here, uh, uh, don't overextend my personal investment? And lose the souls of my children. So, so, uh, so the taxation of this has drawn on me in a way that's been like, okay, these things are super meaningful. And I don't want to put them as a backseat at all. But third service and upper room and another prayer service night and such like that, I'm like, I think I'm going to have to like mobilize others to truly champion these things. And, and for sure delegate and or for sure make room for others. And so I think we're close-ish on being able to make room for others to champion prayer nights, upper room services and such. So I think we're close. And, and I think this is actually the structural or the governing concept that is really being developed in our community as to, okay, who's going to do this? Is it going to be me authoring another third service, but it's just more prophetic no, I, I actually don't think that's the call. I don't think that's in God's heart for this community. I, I don't want to be the celebrity guy just putting on a different coat for different gatherings uh, and doing all of the things. Uh, and, and also, I, I, want to, I want to invest in my family, and I want to be a good father, and I want to be present in those places. Um, and, and that's a really, I'm trying to make intentional decisions in this growth pattern. Um, and we are in a growth pattern. So it's like sometimes I talk about it in a way that's like growth, growth to those who don't have it can sometimes sound like the solution to everything. But growth also pr presents and or instability is presented in a place of community when a bunch of people come in. And instability being that there's new ideas, there's new conflicts, there's new dynamics to be resolved. 
Uh, and uh, Tyler was telling me the quote the other day is, instability comes before growth, right? I don't even know. I probably butchered that one. But there's this concept, right, in our community that as we're growing and as these things are taking place, there's, there's a lot of instability in a good way. There's new visions. There's, there's prophetic things that are rising, and, I, and I'm not a prophet. So I'm like, well, this is cool, so what do we do about it? How do we make room for it? How do we make room for the apostolic? How do we make room for the teachers? And how do we make room for the evangelists? How do we make room for all of these thriving and growing and or budding little seeds budding out of the ground? And we're like, look at that. That's kind of cool. What do we do with that? How do we make room for it? How do we nurture it? Oh, look at that. There's some weeds around it. What do we do with that? And, and there's just so much to do on it. There's so much that can be done. And uh, all the while, I really try and yield to God on these things. Like, okay, what's my part? And what is my part when others have a part to play? Uh, and so is Tim going to be the upper room guy? Is somebody else going to be the upper room guy as far as the service is concerned? Is it not going to be that and is it going to be something else? And I ask these questions a lot. Um, but I think ultimately I'm really trying to keep my, my ears really close to what God is saying and doing. Um, and sometimes it looks like us marching up the hill with a sacrifice in mind and him going, actually, I have a different thing. And then we're like, cool, awesome. I want to stay current on what you're saying. Yeah, so I, I do believe, in, and this is actually funny because this actually came to my heart as I was preparing for this. I was like, what do I say about these things that we intend to do or we've intended to do and we haven't yet seen fulfilled or achieved? And, um, and sometimes it, it gives me some anxiety, like, I, I got to achieve this thing because we set out to achieve it. And it's like, well, I think, I, 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 I think it's okay to be honest that some things we've seen and we've realized and some things we haven't seen or realized yet, but we're really believing that God's going to do it in us and through us. And I, I believe my part and our part as a mountain leadership is to mine what your part is and what your vision is really, really faithfully and to steward that and to cultivate that and to partner really well with that and to make room for it. So the, the ending objective of this thing for me is honestly, I, I want to go on a discovery journey with all of you. Whatever your design and purpose is, we want to partner well with that. We want to champion it. We want to cultivate it. We want to breathe on it. We want to say yes to it, bring life to it. We want to truly love well when it comes to your design and purpose and see that thing realized. It might just be us connecting you with somebody else. It might be us uh, actually seeing your ministry thrive in this space. I'm not sure what it looks like. It'll look different for each person but we are definitely committed to this journey. We believe it will be the next chapters of what this church's shape looks like, is mining your design and purpose and championing it. You guys down for that journey? <clears throat> if you have any other questions, you can send them in. Uh, we will be responding to them on the website and also posting um, this video uh, this um, town hall video on our website. We'll have a town hall page for it. Uh, and there will be little like minute markers on where we talked about what and such. Um, and any other questions you've got, uh, if you've got notes or thoughts or ideas and you want to kind of write on them, draw them up, and you want to turn them in uh, and give them to us, you can this week or any week to come. Uh, we'll always be developing and doing different issues of this thing. And we'll also give it to people uh, when it's their first time. So they can be introduced to not only, you know, our names and our faces and our awesome personalities, uh, but also some of our core values and deep convictions that we carry in this community. You guys ready to finish in prayer? Yeah. All right, sweet. That was fun. Did you guys have fun? Yeah. All right, awesome. Let's do this. You want to stay with us? We'll finish. Tim, you want to finish this out in prayer? Yeah. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. God, I just thank you. <clears throat> I thank you for the gifts that you've planted within the people that you've placed us in community with, the people that you've put in this circle of family. God, I just pray that you'd give us hearts and minds to understand and know what it is that you're doing and saying in the lives and hearts of each people, each of the people that you send to us. God, give us the capacity or give us the structure and give us the arms we need to get, uh, get our arms around what it is you're sending and to hear clearly what it is you're saying. God, I just pray you'd give us unified hearts of yieldedness to the to the design of heaven, to the call of heaven among our lives. 
And God, I just pray that you teach us, Lord, when we, when we make a misstep, that you put us right back on the path, right back on the journey, Lord, that we won't, uh, we won't worry about taking a wrong turn because you'll recalculate it and get us back on course. So, God, I just pray a blessing over the mountain, over the families of the mountain, over the people that you've put here, placed here for a purpose, whether they're going to remain here for years to come or they're going to come here and they're going to be filled up or they're going to be prayed over or they're going to be partnered with and then they're going to go out. Father, we're not here to build a kingdom on earth other than the kingdom of heaven. Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we yield ourselves to that purpose. And we just ask you to continue to guide us lovingly along the way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.